all that easy. Sorry, sorry, Frank. Uh, so I'm just going to introduce you again. So we're here to a conversation with Frank Heckman. He's currently in, did you say Denmark right now? No, Netherlands. The Netherlands, Dutch. <laughs> Dutch. So we're talking about community building and the new global village, and we're just sharing a lot of different ideas all over the place. But we have a lot of common contacts and interest in the open source community, uh, the, uh, even the topics of flow and, and human performance. But yeah, Frank, go ahead. Keep going. Yeah, I was I was just uh, uh, telling Marcin that my, you know, years back in uh, 2004, I was what they called the master coach of the Dutch Olympic team to go to Athens. And... Uh, and they were beginning to show some interest in the inner aspects of performance. They were, you know, not just the physical, raw physical, uh, you know, training, but uh, what is the mental part of it? Strangely enough, people read some books about it, but they actually don't do it as a discipline. Yeah. I'm a martial artist by background and still am, and I train. I'm, I'm, I'm a member of a fight club for more than 40 years. I'm nearly 70 years old. And, uh, and I helped the Dutch uh, Olympic team to, uh, to uh, go on an inner journey, uh, becoming immortal on Mount Olympus, because it was the Olympic Games in Athens. Yeah. What's the inner game, and how do you do this? A lot of this is social. It's the uh, talent really starts to flow, if you will, if you uh, come home somewhere. If you can really feel embedded in, into a small community, whether it's a team or an organization, or the Olympic team for that mean. So we, we stress that part a lot, and we, we did workshops on our way to Athens and uh, in uh, uh, using Campbell's work, the hero's journey. Yeah. And, uh, and so. That helped me a lot in the in the research to see that you can organize flow and that you uh, and that the community is uh, critically important for any individual to to really release their talent. And you were raised in a, in a, in, a, in a nation, and I lived in the U.S. for about 12 years, mm -hmm. where the individual was above suspicion. You know how dangerous that is. Look at your own uh, country right now. I think yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a fallacy. We are species, and we are really, by nature, groups of species, and we, are, and we function well as species. Uh, if we take away the hindrances, all the, the, the separations and the fragmentations that are all built into the system, right. we take those away, human beings can do fantastic things. Yeah. And if, they, if they have a common purpose, and they have some common ground that... Uh, brings them together and some uh, challenge that they need to succeed, you know, like what you're doing or whether it's sports or whether it's music, people are, are, are transcending themselves and they're doing great things. Yeah. So I have, I have a lot of hope and optimism for humanity because we don't need to learn how to work together. It's inborn, it's hardwired. Yeah. So on, on open source design and products, what's your involvement in any of that? It's not too much, I would say. It's uh, I, I mean, I was basically watching and uh, the people in uh, New Mall of the Pac-21 in uh, in uh, 2015, before the during the COP21 or before that they were in Paris uh, outside working and designing things. I was looking what their social construct was and how they would uh, when yeah. they would stop fight <laughs> and see what was happening there i was just learning looking at them and watching and they would counsel with me and peter peter was the the owner of the castle when it really got rough they would come out and say shit how do we how do we solve this mm -hmm. and fighting so but they did they did really well uh, i'm not uh, a technologist i'm uh, i mean i'm a social scientist but I think, uh, you know, as you see with all the social media, uh, a network is not a community. You know, it's, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of things that we still need to learn. And it's, uh, and it's what I think what we need now is unprecedented collaboration. Things that working together in a way that we've never done before. And uh, we can't get around it. There's no option. Because this is our last step. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, time is running out. We have to go fast. Yeah. So, 
my question to you, Masha, would be how, how can we work together and how can we help each other? Yeah. Well, one thing is uh, just, just a new thing for me here is a uh, potential pilot. Like, they want me to teach uh, Africans, so a pilot where we would teach Africans to build tractors for, for their own use. Now, this is pretty different. So, basically, DIY production for mechanizing in a country like Ghana. Now, first of all, does it make sense? Is it more of Western colonialism? Uh, but the option is there where we would actually build... Uh, teach people to build in the form of open source micro factories, off grid micro factories. So, so the package would include that we bring in open source equipment that then would be transferred, the technology transfer would happen to the local people so they can start building their economy. And uh, the funder's business model on that was actually finance. So, but it's, it's an interesting thing that's, that's come up. And since you talk about working in Africa, that's something I would want to question, you know, just uh, question you about. But the other thing is, just more about the general uh, setting up a general framework for the local copy shop like as opposed to fab labs which are kind of elite and not really uh, they're about like the rare inventor and kind of positioning themselves as look at this super innovation well we don't need any any innovation we need the transmission of knowledge that's already there so for example uh, the open source micro factory is a copy shop for any community for local production is a sound idea in my view um, so those are the two, you know, two topics yeah. that we work on right now. But immediately in the United States, we, we started running workshops on the 3D printer builds and op basically the small desktop micro factory for plastics right. recycling and 3D printing. So we're teaching teachers how to design real products and how to use 3D printers and so forth. So that's, that's currently what we're getting into. That's actually how Cindy, uh, we were, uh, had some of those conversations about doing some workshops in Chicago, and we've got two people that we just hired full-time for California. So we're, we just had an immersion training program where we, we train them to do the, the workshop builds. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, hook, I'll hook you up to Henry Mentig. He's a great entrepreneur, green entrepreneur and all that. He has a, an old ferry house, which is ancient. It used to be an artist studio, and he calls it the... Uh, uh, the Global Trading Center. Global Village uh, Center? The, the Global Trading Center. Global Trading Center? Not the Global Trading Center, but the Global Trading Center. Where is that? Uh, and it's in Holland. And uh, everything, uh, what happens in that place, is about building the new economy. And he's uh, building that village also around him. And he would be very interested in what you're doing. Oh, interesting. It's, uh, the people there, I was, uh, I designed my, my work is I'm a social architect. I design uh, interventions with people that do really new things. So if it's really simple, I'll give, uh, in Holland, for instance, we, uh, we are now uh, what is called the energy transition. It's something that the, uh, the Economic Council has really put on to us. But people were fighting, you know, they were in court cases and you got all these things of so industry against the green uh, organizations. So then usually people call me in and say, we are fighting, we are in court, but basically we all want to do something with energy. Uh, can you help out? And then I designed an intervention. I went sailing with these guys for a couple of days and make sure it was stormy so they all get a little bit milder and then we can talk and then we can agree yeah. on things and, uh, and so and we we made a, a market law for energy uh, uh, taxes and, and what's the what's the gentleman's so that, name at the at the uh, his name is henry menting mm -hmm. and his, uh, his place is farik and field house the ferry house i will send you the information Okay. Uh, you make sure that I have your email, whatever address, and I will send it to you. You guys need to connect. Okay. I guess they're working hard on all levels of the the, the, the global economy, the new the new economy. Right. And uh, so yeah, um, and so in Africa, it, you know, you're asking question. Well, how could you go into that? I'm not going there and telling people that they need to restore the landscape. The Maasai people called me through Facebook Messenger. Oh, yeah. There's a young woman that just appeared on my screen. 
uh, she said, hello, Mr. Heckman. I said, hello, Miss Janice, who are you? I'm from Kenya. I said, oh, my God, who is she in thinking? Uh, did I ever add her? Then it happened. She said, what are you doing? I'm beating. She was beating a necklace. She showed me pictures. She said, it looks like a Maasai necklace. Yes, I'm a Maasai woman. So where do you live in the city? No, I live in a small village. I see a picture of a hut. And the women who are building the hut. Is that you? She said, you on top of the hut. No, it's my mother. I said, what do you want to be? I want to become a diplomat. I want to study international relations. I said, but you're a Maasai woman. You live in a, in, in, in a hut in the community. She said, yeah, but I went to boarding school and I speak English and I, uh, I want to go out into the world. But why aren't you studying? Why are you home? My mom, mom's cows died because of a severe drought for the last two years. We lost our livestock. I said, well, what are you going to do about it? We don't know. We're, we're in dire straits. I said, go speak to my friend, Winter Nemesel. He's a tropical from Tanzania. No, we're looking at Mount Kilimanjaro from our village. I said, well, why don't you uh, get in contact? I got Vin on the... On, on the, on the Who's the, the guy? And he, Sorry, who's the guy? And, who's the ecologist? Well, he's, he's worked for 30 years in Peru. He's doing fantastic work in restoring landscapes and pulling people out of poverty. And he's, he's a tough guy. He just lets the communities do it. They all went to visit the Maasai, very proud people. They came back and they said, come here, you need to help us. I flew in from India. I drove up to that village somewhere in the middle of nowhere. I stayed there for a month, walked to every village with them. And everyone said, let's go do the program. And they, they start doing it. They are in charge. They hired me. They're who is the me guy, that. who's the ecologist that you mentioned? What's his name? His name is Vin Van Immersel. His name, he's got a big organization in, in uh, Peru. He lives in Peru, Pachamama Rami. And his uh, program in, uh, in uh, Tanzania is called Greening Africa. And he's now starting also in Ambuseli in Kenya. And I, I, my way of working is that I look at landscapes and trying to identify whole landscapes. So in uh, Kenya, I've called it White Mountain because the Maasai people call uh, Kilimanjaro Odonyo Oibor. In Maasai, that means White Mountain. And it has yeah. a whole story to it. So we presented it on the, on the Global Landscape Forum uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, and uh, we brought all the indigenous people and they were speaking for an hour and a half and people loved it and uh, trying to get uh, all the parties involved to sit at the table and see if we can make some agreement after, uh, you know, conflicts, long, long, long conflicts, conservation and uh, all after all. And, uh, but the land is deteriorating and it's... A lot of desert farming, and it's going fast. It's going downhill fast. So, but people can restore it. That's where John comes in. John Yu. He can tell people. He's the he's the, he's the ambassador of hope. Are you when talking about the Global Indigenous Forum from the Florida International University? No, the Global Landscape Forum is a UN uh, uh, protected uh, forum. It has its seat in Bonn in, uh, in uh, Germany and it's uh, well it's you know many years of scientists on, on landscape uh, uh, development uh, hydrogeologists all of these people landscape people but now since Paris the focus is uh, 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 climate adaptation mitigation how do you restore on a, on a large scale level because we need to cool the planet so yeah. you need to restore, you know, millions of hectares. Now, are the, you know, the powers that be so-called are like the leading businesses behind this, or this is uh, kind of uh, more fringe? No, because in, in Nairobi, there was, uh, this year it was in Nairobi, uh, thank God, because I was already working there. There were 1,200 people from all over the world, mm -hmm. governments, uh, presidents, the World Bank, uh, all the big institutions are there, the African Development Bank, you know, also all the big financial uh, streams are there too. Uh, so uh, we're trying to, to we're trying, we're, we're creating a proof of concept by working locally and showing that you can do it. I brought some people to Tanzania because we're three years in the making there. 
and it's pretty astounding what they're doing. And we're started now in in in, uh, in uh, 40 communities in in Kenya, and in many many more. To but I'll yeah. be speaking with the uh, Minister of Environment uh, in three weeks, and ask, I'm going to ask him to be on board and, and assign us to do this, because I don't want to be the white man that's coming from abroad here. You guys need to take charge. God damn it, it's your country. God damn it, because you don't believe in a white man's burden, right? You believe in the next generation. I don't want to do this. Right. I'm, okay, I'm, so let me ask you this cool question. You probably, have, you, you probably haven't been asked that, but uh, I bet you haven't. So what happens to the American prairies that are totally degraded uh, over the years and they're, they're a mess? That's where I live. Uh, is there any plan to regenerate all that? Because I'm, I'm doing it for my part. We can do it. Why, why, I, I wish I had John here. John is, uh, is here and he's proposing what is called the ecological restoration camps. He wants hundreds of thousands of those camps all over the world. He's okay. starting his space and he... He, he's he's from America. He came from the Midwest. He was born and raised in the Midwest. Oh, oh, maybe we can. It. Hey, maybe we can collaborate on the ecological restoration lab slash open source fab lab on our land right here. How about that? Without doubt, you can do that. It's a done deal. Done deal. I, done deal. If, if he would be here, he'd say yes. Okay. He wants to start, and he what he brings in is. Uh, uh, you know, you bring in all the people that are disenfranchised and that feel there is no hope, and then they can do the great work of our time because it needs work. Yeah. And they build nurseries. Yeah. So and they look excellent. And so, do you know? Uh, do you know the work of Phil Rudder in America, who's proposing ch chestnuts and hazelnuts as perennial replacements for corn and soybeans? Well, that seems like a good idea. Yeah, because we're doing some of that work here in terms of developing the crop. Yeah. We, well, you need to you need to cover the land. You do. You need to the are the, are the, are the answer. You can't. It's the heating up way too fast, and the, and the desertification in America is just as bad as anywhere else. You know. In America, like yeah. you're talking about throughout the Southwest. Yeah. But uh, anywhere the prairies are. I mean, but the savanna in Africa in Tanzania and, uh, and Kenya, people think about those safaris and all that. It's tragic, Marcin, it's tragic. I mean, if I walk there and I, the Maasai take me to all these lands and they show me in the national parks, it's not better. So all these people and a billion dollar tourist industry that they have, well, for how long? If they continue this way in 10 years, it's done. It's that fast. When it heats up that fast, you know, you can see those sandstorms in the, in the hot summers, you know, it, it's just happening every day. So it's like it's just creeping up. You have to restore, you have to re... You can... When I ask the older people, I sit under the tree. You can look at my uh, website and I'm building a new one, but you see some of those pictures. And I ask the older people, I ask grandma, I said, oh, what was it like 30, 40 years ago? Oh, she said, trees everywhere. Oh, yeah, and yeah. So, and, and is the same condition happening throughout America with semi-arid lands that there were more trees before? Absolutely. Absolutely. God damn it, I knew it. Absolutely. I love the Southwest, but I'm telling you that I'm all of that is like the Texas lands, like uh, Oklahoma, man. It's it's crazy. But, and I could see the, the lush forests that were there not too long ago. Man, I, all, I could just picture it. All those fucking monocultures destroyed the land. In my country too. Your country too? I mean, they're doing agriculture and just, oh, they're fertilizing the, the soil to death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now it's a complete wheat. All the wheat that grows in our country doesn't produce one single bread because the nutrient value is so low that we import all our wheat oh. from elsewhere. What do, you, what do you do with your wheat? Do you, you feed give it to, to poor people? You feed it to the animals. You feed it to the animals? Yeah. Wow, wow. That's happening in your country too. Yeah. A lot of it's being fed to the animals. Yeah. So, yeah, yes, in, in here in the savannah, you see these very chic Toyota Land Cruises with all the Savari people. And, and then I hear them say, this is your typical savannah landscape 
only seen in Africa. And then the Maasai people say, well, this wasn't like this even 10 years ago. <laughs> oh, wow. That's really insightful. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, one more thing. So I, I recently connected with a fellow named David Lee from China, who I'm going to visit pretty soon. But he's doing uh, what he calls fab villages in China. So basically getting modern technology to villages for local production. And we're talking about collaborating in some open source automated agriculture, like our open source tractor that we, we can put like GPS and automation on it. But basically um, revitalizing, kind of giving tools to like the advanced tools to people that actually need it and can actually use it so that he, he, he mentioned this one st statement, which he said that people today are more interested in putting tractors on a blockchain than on the farm. You know, when he talks about the new innovation happening in the world today. Um, well, you were talking about Africa. The misconception about Africa is that, that uh, it's booming and it's, the entrepreneurial spirit is soaring. And a lot of people are out there to do it. And in Kenya, for instance, they uh, they just uh, toss the developmental status out the window. So they don't want any money from anybody. They're, it's business to business. And they're doing well. In 10 years, they're the biggest rose uh, export country in the world. Kenya? They got, a, they got a logistics system that will knock your socks off. You're talking they about have, Kenya? They, Kenya, yeah. So they're, they're moving. There's also a lot of poverty still. But if you bring in technology and that would mean autonomy and that they can be in charge, people take life back into their own hands, you know, on so, three levels. So who can Very we, well. Okay, so who can we connect to that are actually with respect to local autonomy creation? John, come and meet my friend Marcy. John just Oh came yes. In. He knows you, John. You're already famous before well, of you see. Of course, for the regeneration work in China. But yeah, we're just talking about we're talking about regenerating the prairies in in America here, where I live in Kansas City, because of course the corn and soybean annual monocultures. Phil Rudder in America. I don't know if you know him, but he's talking about corn corn and soybeans replaced by perennial hazelnut and and chestnut, and that's what he's working on on a 50-year time scale. And we're actually collaborating in some of that work, and that's where we need to talk, yeah maybe do something about that. Yeah. That's made a deal with him, with you, that ecosystems restoration camps will start also there. Yeah, I think you, probably if you're very interested in that idea, it would be good to connect you to what's going on in California. Nice. Where in California? Well, all over California. So the whole kind of permaculture convergence concept is coming together around the idea that it doesn't really serve to have all these different organizations working in isolation. Why don't we yeah. all collaborate? Yeah. And that, it is, that there's too much conceptual stuff. It's virtual. You know, we need more real things. Here you go. So by yeah. by having ecosystem restoration camps, mm -hmm. the people and all we, we we the camps idea is to build the basic infrastructure wherever there's degraded landscapes and wherever people want the land to be restored. And it also you mentioned the like chestnuts and other Hazel. per, hazelnuts and chestnuts. This is about productivity. And when we finally do the real analysis of the ec economy, but also of the, you know, the existing economy and a real economy, an economy based on ecological yeah. function, then ecological function is just vastly more valuable than production. And that allows us to actually have a kind of evolutionary growth. Yeah. Rather, than, rather than this fake growth of more consumption, more manufacturing, and more waste, and more pollution, and more degradation, mm -hmm. so, so that's actually creating poverty, and the 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 vast disparity between the people who pursue material wealth and then 
separate themselves from those who are desperately poor at the edges of large degraded ecosystems. You know, that, yeah. that really is, 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 is war. You know, yeah. basically you're going to end up in war and collapse of the civilization. So that's pretty well known in yeah. China and pretty well known in all ancient civilizations because that's the way it always goes. It's yeah. been plenty of experience in that. So yeah. if you want to follow that pers you know, direction, then you're going to end up in the same. Yeah. Marson, why don't you tell John in a nutshell what a great stuff you're doing? Yeah, so uh, I founded Open Source Ecology. We design and build open source industrial machines. But the relevant things might be like, okay, how do you do that? But through distributed production, local open source micro factories. So like David Lee from China, he's one of the lead people behind Fab Villages where he's trying to say, okay, let's, let's bring production that really matters. Not the open source Fab Lab for, for new, like, new, new nonsense technology, but the open source micro factory for meeting real needs and real communities. So basically putting tractors not on a blockchain, but putting tractors on a farm kind of deal, you know. So, so talking about real applied technology that's open source, distributed. And I mentioned to, to Frank about a project that we're possibly getting into a pilot of bringing, training local Africans, like in Ghana, for example, to, to build equipment there for their own use if they want to do that. So I always question, okay, how do we uh, deploy technology that's truly appropriate technology on a grand scale through open source? Uh, so basically bypass the, the consumerism, but get into more of the local restoration and local production, the, the taking care of our local resources, because we start connecting to the fact that, well, they actually give all the wealth that we have in the world today. So, for example, here, I'm, I'm on 30 acres in Ken near Kansas City, Missouri, and, you know, we have like two inches of topsoil, you know, from de degradation, whereas it used to be like six feet of topsoil, and, you know, so I'm familiar with that, and all that. But our work is on, on open source tools, just open source know-how that pe we can empower communities with for the global village, the local economy, uh, distributed local economies that are open source. Yeah. And I'm, I would be curious, like, if you see the need, is there a need for equipment and restoration work? Because, you know, talking to people like Mark Shepard, for example, or the permaculture guys, I mean, like the China stuff, I mean, that's big equipment and a lot of labor. Uh, that's restoring massive, you know, ga gaining the waterworks back and restoring, uh, moving earth. Like, do you see that as a big part? Well, I think if you stay in touch with us, we're starting to work on an industrial scale, but it isn't yet with the open source. It's more with trying to transition the polluting industries to be, to stop their negative behaviors and try to, to Aikido their industrial capacity for regeneration. Mm -hmm. So, and, and this is a project in the Middle East where the situation is grim, you know, like, like this is, this is not Missouri. This is like no vegetation kind of mm -hmm. places and make no, no, they, they, they kind of talk about no rainfall that every once in a while they have flash floods and there are big gullies there. So, the the thing is silly that you know that basically it's just you know those were the places that were called like the Garden of Eden or the right, land right. of Mount Street, you know so they're all mixed up now. Um, but what I do see is that we need to have a kind of a sequencing thing. So what what I'm looking at now is the need for infrastructure development for camping. So if we if we were to go to a type of semi-nomadic lifestyle for people on a temporary basis, so that say 50 to 100, I, I probably not as many as 100, maybe 50 people in camps at any given time, in, in a single camp, 50 people at any given time, had basically left the consumer society and was living, eating together, sleeping in yurts or teats, and, and having, having composting toilets and saunas if it's water scarce, and, uh, but, and working about five hours a day, five days a week. So, and then the rest of the time doing meditation and self 
self study or collaborative study or recreation or music or whatever you want. So basically, let's go camping has been my the slogan. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, it's 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 basically let's go camping and restore a little piece of paradise every day. So imagine if there were a thousand or ten thousand of these little camps anywhere huh. anywhere that there's degraded land. So this this excites me. It's called ecosystem restoration camps dot org. Huh. You can see it online. And uh, essentially what I think it does is it could make it possible for every human being to participate in mitigation and adaptation to climate change. And it, it takes it right out of the commercial, right out of the 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 wow. mercantile. And it and it does it does everything because it, it means that during that time when the people are there studying and working on this they're not in the consumption society. Now, if they do that for two or three weeks or two or three months, what happens is they get kind of sort of socialized into another way of life where they start to question, well, wait a minute, why was I going to the supermarket or this giant box store? Wow. And, you know, what are all these cars for? <laughs> you know, I mean, suddenly, you know, and, and then you feel the cold and the wind and the, the rain and the snow and you... You know, you're in another space, so nature isn't so... And, and every the conversation in these camps, we have one now in Spain, so we sort of see what the conversation is about. It's about, like, indigenous microbiologic uh, agents, and, you know, I mean, how, how, how to... The difference between fungal compost and anaerobic and aerobic can you know, inoculation, what, what's the possibility for inoculation yeah. or mycorrhizal fungi and, you know, what, what's a, what is a plant guild and, you know, what is the keystone species, indigenous, endemic, exotic, invasive. What's the, what's the revenue model? Does people, does this have a revenue model where the people who, who participate pay? No, it's it's not a revenue model. It's a concept, and what we've done is we've said if we we have kind of four types of people that we are imagining right now, or five. <laughs> One would be constructors. So, like constructor camp, constructor camps, where these camps, the infrastructure is being designed and built. You could even flat pack it. Imagine. Imagine if you added this to, say, the refugee camps in Africa or the migrant situation in the Mediterranean with all these people who are sleeping under bridges or, you know, practically dying and, or dying in the Mediterranean. And so if you, if you put it next to them, let's talk about refugees or migrants, they're out of place. You know, they're not at home. They're someplace else, and they're not supposed to be there. And the people who have them now, they don't want them. They they want them to go home. So they they're they're in temporary situations. So that actually, ecosystem restoration camps fits perfectly in this because it's not meant to be a permanent settlement. It's meant to be a place to learn how to restore the ecosystem by restoring the ecosystem. And when you add when you add restoration to regenerative agriculture. So you're so most of the permaculture crowd and everybody they're talking about production. But what I've been studying and working on for the last twenty five years is really about ecological function in at large scale. So this is more about the natural zone rather than a production capacity. Now the funny thing about this is, when I first started talking about it, they said, well, how can we do that? We need production. And I actually said to them, I said, are you crazy? What do you think? You think a dysfunctional ecosystem is more productive than a functional ecosystem? You're, you're insane. You know, it doesn't mean, when I say function, that we don't want productivity. It means that productivity follows function yeah. because... The, the functionality is the source and the production is the derivative. 
So the more functional it is, the more productive it is. So just if you once you get this in mind, and when you when you actually realize this, the fact is, the more functional functional it is, the more valuable it is. And this is the way to completely change the existing economy. And here I'm going to stop John for a moment because Marcia and I want to also hear a little bit about your needs and wishes and uh, and uh, what are you making of this? I'm supposed to go upstairs too. <laughs> Stay here, man. Stay here. <laughs> what, where are you at with uh, what? Are you trying to boot this off in many locations? Well, we're How's trying going? to do this. On planetary scale. We have uh, one camp in Spain. The The organization is starting to, to self-organize and self-govern in California. We have requests for camps in Mexico, Kenya, if, if, if their project in Kenya goes for this, mm -hmm. and in India, possibly. Nepal, Nepal, India, there, Peru, there are many possibilities, and, 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 the, okay. and the Netherlands. Who is paying for it? Well, what we're suggesting is that everybody who wants to be, so I see campers, I see constructor camps, I see supporters. Now, the supporters are kind of, they're, we're asking people who want to become supporting members to share 10 euros per month or that's 120 euros per year now if that as an individual this is a tiny sacrifice if you're in the developed world it's a bit more if you're in the developing world i think there are some people that we we don't expect them to do that but you know if we have let's say a million members that's 120 million euros per year and we calculate that what's that noise? I don't know, I was thinking, I don't know um, it's a crying child Okay. Mm -hmm. I should not go you want to no, no, no. okay, so crying children let crying children cry I don't know, so um, anyway what we think is it's about 300,000 or maybe more in capital costs to build a kind of very nice teepee or your type of place that has that's not good I think so you're a, you're a peacemaker go make peace um but uh, do you have any need for things like so we build open source compressed earth block presses so that you can use the dirt from the site to build structures with would that be relevant here I think it's relevant in some places it sort of depends on whether you can build permanent uh, facilities or semi I mean I know with earth earth architecture you can knock it down with a bulldozer in one day so and it all's biodegradable, so it's not such a big deal, except for, I mean, you have to take out the windows and doors and stuff, but they could go down quickly. What we're talking about mainly is teepees, yurts, Bedouin tents, safari tents, mm -hmm. uh, at, because they're semi, you know, they're movable. Yeah. And then floors, beds, furniture, that sort of thing. I, I would also say there is a, there is a fab aspect of this. I think that we all these places should have woodworking, metalworking, craft shops and so on too. Because that sort of takes you out and, and even beyond that, like the kitchens yeah. need to to change in into what is it? The mother is standing in the middle of the law and not interfering. She's standing in what? The mother is standing in the middle of the law and not interfering. Are there how many children are there? She's Wrong kid. She's in. She's in. She's in church. Is she yeah. going crazy? No, no, not the mother. But no, the kids. All right. So, so an interesting case for regeneration slash open source microfactory rolled out in in, a, in different places, like bottom yeah, kind of course. development. Yes, I and think I think he's he's doing some really. I think really I think it, well. I 
please link us together yeah. um, in different ways. Yeah. Yes, yes. Email and yeah. Well, email all and you are email. now. We we can. That's just the high G. Well, you are connected. Okay. But um, I I think for instance we were talking about clinics. Even if you you know if you get to the point where you have sort of maybe alternative medicine or some homeopathic or something, um, you know, certainly wellness, wellness, not mm -hmm. not so met, you know, not not well, treating your sickness, best, your best food doctor, treating sorry. treating health, <laughs> treating health, yeah. Um, so all of that should happen in these kinds of camps, and yeah. yeah. And also, I think that what they do, the other, the other thing I'm thinking about is geodesic domes. So if you like, if you like the idea of ge geodesic domes, because they're kind of um, movable, like if you take them apart, you can yeah. put them back. So, so imagine, the one I'm imagining is every camp has one geodesic dome, at least, probably more than one. And the one I'm interested in is the one that has a, a recording studio uh, inside. So we can use small video, small audio, digital audio. It's very high quality, but it's pretty simple and inexpensive. Yeah. And, and then it has a sound system so that when you open the thing, it's a stage. And outside is an amphitheater. So every weekend in every camp, it's a festival. Without without having to like drive in trucks and and hook up anything, yeah. you just just open the geodesic dome, and it's a it's a it's the stage, and you're on the festival, and then then that way more people are attracted to learn about what is this thing, this ecosystem restoration yeah. camp yeah. out. Oh, it's everybody eats for free. Everybody does a little bit of work, and we and it yeah. turns. Into John, but don't you think we can get guilty rich people to cherish this kind of experience and pay for it too? Yes, yes. <laughs> so a lot of the a lot of the effort now is into that, and we have had probably around probably more more money coming in from wealthy people than coming in from members. But I think we want to have mass membership because that actually means that the ownership is with, firmly with the people and those people who are donating large amounts of money don't get some kind of special treatment. Yeah. Well, uh, but it kind of makes me also think of corporate team building retreats. Perfect ground for yeah. to get, the, get, get that sector of the economy involved in this very fundamental work and changing their perspectives. That would be awesome. It's already sort of happening. We yeah. have Patagonia, the Patagonia yeah. company. Oh, yeah. We have a couple of other, other yeah. you know, this is awesome stuff. Hey, people, but I, I do have an, actually another meeting. This is, I mean, this is too precious to give up, but, I mean, Frank, maybe we can follow up. On no, no, no. I'm, I'm back, back on here. Hello. <laughs> another no. time. Oh, oh it's uh, the, the camera is stuck. Yeah, yeah the camera is stuck for me here, but... I actually have another meeting, but can can we actually? Um... Yeah, we will. We will. We can. We can hook up. Um, next week, I'm still here, and then I'm off okay. to uh, off to. But it doesn't matter. We can also Skype in in every time. Excellent, excellent, and, uh, John. Thanks so much for talking. And yeah, I, I got to get going. But okay. yes, Thank this is excellent. You. So great introductions. Yeah. Um, hope to take this yes. forward. So we'll continue on email. Yes. Uh, good luck with it all, man. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. We'll, we'll be talking. Okay. Congratulations on your good work. Thank good you. Work. No, 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 no. Congratulations to you because you're changing massive acres. <laughs> oh, wow.